Now, tetralogy with pulmonary atresia is one of the subsets of pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defects. And many people continue to describe this as pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect. But to me, that is inappropriate because this subset of pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect stands out as an entity in its own right. And the major reason for that is because of the arrangement of the pulmonary arteries, which we're going to discuss over the next few minutes. But if we look at hearts having the pulmonary arterial anatomy that we're going to describe, at least nine-tenths and maybe even 98% have the intracardiac anatomy of tetralogy. So if we look inside the heart, we find that the variability of the ventricular septal defect reflects that which we've just described in the setting of tetralogy with pulmonary stenosis, in that in about four-fifths of cases the defect is perimembranous, but we can also find cases with muscular postural inferior rim, and we can find those that have doubly committed and juxta arterial defects extending up for its pulmonary valve. So here you see a nice example, a typical example of tetralogy with pulmonary atresia, and at the posterior inferior margin, there's fibrous continuity between the aortic and tricuspid valves, giving us a perimembranous defect. And in a subset, perhaps a third to a fifth of them, we find the muscular posterior inferior rim that you see interposing between the leaflets of the tricuspid valve, the overriding aortic valve. And then in a small subset, as seen in this case, we find that the defect extends all the way to an imperforate pulmonary valve, in this particular instance being associated with a muscular posterior inferior rim. So in each of these instances, the intracardiac anatomy is that of tetralogy with pulmonary atrium rather than stenosis. Then when we look at the infundibular morphology, we can find that in some, the obstruction is at the level of the pulmonary valve. We can find in others, as in tetralogy, there has been failure of muscularization of the outlet septum. And in yet others, there is atresia at the mouth of the muscular infundibulum or muscular atresia beneath the pulmonary valve. And if we look at the pulmonary trunk, we can find still further variability, now reflecting the presence of pulmonary atresia in that the trunk can be patent to the base of the right ventricle no more than a fibrous strand, or completely absent when the right and left pulmonary arteries themselves are discontinuous. And indeed, those pulmonary arteries themselves can be absent within the pericardial cavity, giving a solitary arterial trunk. So here are the various patterns that we can find at the ventricular arterial junction. In some instances, rare but certainly existent, there is an imperforate pulmonary valve making the atresia valva. In the majority of cases, we see the situation like this, in which the outflow tract itself is blind ending, and the pulmonary trunk is either a fibrous strand or becomes patent immediately above the, valva, the ventricular arterial junction which does not contain any valvar tissue, hence giving us muscular atresia. And then in other cases, there is no pulmonary trunk, and in absence of the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries, this becomes, of course, a solitary arterial trunk. But the key to analysis of all these cases, and the reason that they stand on their own as a subset within pulmonary atresia and ventricular septal defect, is the source of the pulmonary arterial supply. In some of these, as with the majority of cases of ordinary pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect, for example, in the setting of transposition or congenitally corrected transposition or functionally univentricular heart, the source of pulmonary arterial supply is from the arterial duct. And on occasion, the pulmonary arteries can be discontinuous and then each of the pulmonary arteries can be supplied by its own arterial duct. In a very small subset of cases, the pulmonary arterial supply comes through an aortopulmonary window. And if you read the literature, 
you will find other examples where allegedly the pulmonary arteries come through a fifth aortic arch. And indeed, I have co-authored articles myself describing presence of the fifth aortic arch in the setting of tetralogy with pulmonary atresia. Since I've spent the last five years or so studying in depth the development of the normal heart, and I can never find a fifth aortic arch, I now find it difficult to see how this entity can exist in tetralogy when it does not exist in the normal situation. So I'm afraid I no longer believe in the existence of the fifth aortic arch, despite what I have written previously in the literature. In other rare instances, there can be fistulous communications between the coronary arteries that feed the pulmonary arterial pathways. But without question, the most important and the most significant source of pulmonary arterial supply are the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries. And it is because of the presence of these systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries that tetralogy with pulmonary atresia stands in its own right as a subset of pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect. In those other variants of pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect, where the segmental connections are those of complete of regular transposition, congenitally corrected transposition, or isomerism, there are rare cases that have systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries, but in almost all instances when you find these collateral arteries, the intracardiac anatomy is with pulmonary atresia. To understand the, dis the arrangement of these systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries, we need to understand first the bronchopulmonary segments. And as you all know, following the landmark studies of the Lord Brock, there is a regular supply of pulmonary arterial segments, such that there are three in the right upper lobe, two in the right middle lobe, five in the right lower lobe, four left upper lobe, four left lower lobe, giving us 18 in all. And analysis of the pulmonary arterial supply in tetralogy with pulmonary atresia of these pulmonary arterial segments. And in almost all instances when supply is through the arterial duct, as you see in this instance, then the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries themselves are aligned so as to supply all of those segments. This is far from the case when we have systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries. These systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries usually arise from the aorta, hence the acronym of MAPCAS, but they do not always arise from the aorta. In fact, quite often they take their origin from brachiocephalic arteries, or very rarely they can arise from the coronary arteries. And in those circumstances, of course, they are no longer aorto to pulmonary collateral arteries, but they are systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries. So, for a collective term, I much prefer to use systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries, even though MAPCA is much easier and shor shorter to say. The significance of these collateral arteries is that hardly ever do they coexist in the same lung with an arterial duct. There are three or four cases described in the world literature where there is convincing evidence that an arterial duct does indeed coexist with collateral arteries, but they are sufficiently rare as for a working hypothesis to argue that if you find an arterial duct, there will not be collateral arteries in the same lung. Contrarywise, if you find collateral arteries supplying one lung, there will not be an arterial duct. But there usually will be additional intrapericardial arteries. And then the key is to determine how much of the lung is supplied specifically by systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries or how much is supplied by anastomoses with intrapericardial arteries. So this is what the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries look like in the autopsy room. Here we are looking at the aorta from behind and you see that there is a leash of collateral arteries running from the descending segment of the aorta and ramifying to supply both lungs. And when we look at the same heart from the front, 
we can see those origins of the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries from the arch and descending part of the aorta. But the specimen shows us beautifully how, in this instance, the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries are coexisting with the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries that are coming back to take their origin from the right ventricle, albeit with an imperforate valve at the ventricular-arterial junction. But, most importantly, there is no formation of the arterial duct. So when we look at the array, array of individual systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries, in some instances they can connect directly to bronchopulmonary segments and be the sole supply to those segments. But in the majority of instances, they connect via the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries and hence supply much more of the pulmonary parenchyma. So we also need to identify the presence and the site of communications between the two pathways and also to note the presence or absence of any dual supply. So here is a diagrammatic situation in which there is exclusive supply of the right upper lobe, all three of its bronchopulmonary segments, via a systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries. And this is the type of situation viewed from behind where a systemic to pulmonary collateral artery branches, passes either in front or behind the bronchus. The part behind the bronchus is supplying exclusively the middle lobe of the right lung. But as I say, in most instances, these collateral arteries are nastomos with the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries. So here, continuing our cartoon, we have the right upper lobe fed exclusively by the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries. But I've pictured here a host of other intrapericardial pulmonary arteries that are anastomosing at various levels with the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries. And we know that those anastomoses can be extrapulmonary, can be hilar, can be lobar, or can be segmental. And we know that diagnosis depends on defining each of these anastomoses and then determining how much of the parenchyma is fed through the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries. So here is a pretty picture showing you an extra pulmonary, or rather a lobar anastomosis between the systemic to pulmonary collateral artery seen here and the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries. Whereas in this instance, much deeper in the lung, we find a join here between, at segmental level, between the adjacent branches of the systemic to pulmonary collateral artery and the intrapericardial pulmonary artery. So here, the blood feeding through the systemic to pulmonary collateral artery will feed the distal segments, but will also flow in retrograde fashion to fill the rest of the pathway of fed by the intracardial pulmonary arteries. And then we need to take account of dual supply. I doubted the existence of dual supply, but there is no question that it exists. And here, in a very elegant study, Jung Wook So, a Korean pathologist who spent a year with us working at the Royal Brompton Hospital, did this exquisite dissection with Dr. Ho and painted the systemic to pulmonary collateral arteries in red, the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries in blue, and showed unequivocally that they were ramifying within the same bronchopulmonary segments. So there can be dual supply. And then we need to take account of those cases in which the intrapericardial pulmonary arteries are totally absent. In that setting, of course, the supply has to be exclusively through collateral arteries. And as we discussed yesterday, these are those in which the vessel leaving the base of the heart is best described as a solitary arterial trunk. Since had the intrapericardial arteries existed, we do not know whether they would have come from the trunk itself. So here is an example of a solitary arterial trunk, the arterial trunk leaving the base of the heart, no evidence whatsoever of intrapericardial arteries, discontinuous pulmonary arteries at the hilum, with those at the left lung fed by the arterial duct, the arteries to the right lung coming through pulmonary 
collateral vessels. So the bottom line, tetralogy with pulmonary atresia is one subset of patients having pulmonary atresia with ventricular septal defect. The most interesting and perhaps most important of patients falling within subs this subset are those with collateral arteries. And then the key diagnostic conundrum is to determine how many segments are supplied directly by collateral arteries as opposed to how many segments are fed through the intrapericardial pulmonary arterial tree because it is the determination of these features that will dictate the therapeutic approach. Also, of course, you need to determine the number and location of anastomoses between the collateral pathways and the intrapericardial pathways.